Good to be with your family once again for a study of God's Word. I do trust and pray that all is well. God is continuing to smile upon you and your family and your loved ones. You know, that you are just simply leaning and trusting and depending upon God. You know, I kind of believe that's where we are, of course, in this season, where we have to cast all our cares, everything. Don't, not the little stuff, we don't hold on to it. The medium stuff, no. Everything. We need to cast all my cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. As I shared with you on Sunday, you know, we're kind of uh, not wrestling against flesh and blood, but the, the, the armies of the enemy, spiritual wickedness, powers, and, and all kinds of just, just spiritual forces that's been released upon the land. Now we can see the whole earth is groaning, of course, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we have to really buckle our belt. The Bible says, gird up the Lord of truth. You know, we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand. So hang in there. Continue to keep praying and trusting God. And God will never leave you. That's a promise. Never leave you. He will never leave you alone. So he will always be there with us. So even though you might be lonely, just remember you're not alone. God is there. Now I hope you're ready. We're going through the book of 1 Peter. And we're moving on now to chapter 3. Chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. And Lord willing, we will cover all that we can and the allotted time frame that pastors is working with or trying to work with. And I appreciate your patience with that. But again, let's get ready for the word. You have your Bibles with you. Let us pray and, and move forward. Father, again, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. And I send out a special prayer, Lord, for those who are listening, those who are right now, whatever they're going through, wherever they're facing, Father, in Jesus' precious name, Give them the assurance that everything is going to be all right. Give them the assurance, Father God, that you will do something that's above and beyond all they can ask or think. And we pray that, Father. We thank you. We know that this is a kind of a challenging season for a lot of people. But there's nothing too hard for you. And we trust you now. So thank you for those who are part of this Bible study. And I pray in a very special way that you would just shower them with your love, your presence, and your grace. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, once again, I got to take the opportunity to say thank you. Each of you guys, you guys are special. I appreciate you so much. And you make Pastor feel special. Just as important as some, any, any, anyone else out there. And it's good to have you. Because I love you and I thank God for your presence as we study God's Word. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, looking at verse 1. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Be in subjection. Now, you know, remember people, we, 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 we studied this verse, and especially a lot of times in married couples, because it, it is saying that the wife should submit to her husband, and you do that as unto the Lord. You know, it, it, it's not easy. You know, if if you have a spouse or a husband who's 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 not saved, it's it's more challenging. But the the scripture tells us that we should not be unequally yoked anyway with unbelievers. You know, and that's it, it's it, 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 the challenge would be to marry someone who also is saved. It doesn't guarantee. You know, um, success in relationship, but it does give you a good head start to realize that you have someone that has a good foundation. They're already saved, so it's easy to submit to someone. And let me talk to the husbands right now. It's easy to submit to someone who is submitted to God. The husband being the head, you know, God is over him, and and but he's over the household and responsibility. And when it, God is his headship, oh, it's so much easier for the wife to submit to the husband. 
and, and be subject to that to that to that spouse. So we do that. That's what the call is. That if any obey not the word, I like this, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So if there's anyone who does not obey the word, they may also be won by the conversation of the wives. That word conversation does not mean talking. That word conversation means uh, the way of lifestyle, the way of living. You know, so wives, your way of living can 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 captivate your husband in such a way when you live a life of holiness and a life of beauty around him. So I obviously, gee, that's what the scripture is saying. Now, he, he may, without the word, be won by the conversation. The way you carry yourself, the way you present yourself, is what this is saying. And the husband himself can be won. And, and, and by, and be, can be saved by your character and your behavior. Verse 2 says, While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. All right. Whose adorning let it not be that outward appearance. And look at where we live. Look at where uh, society is, the world is. They're, they're just the opposite of that. All the emphasis appears to be placed on the outward appearance. You see all the commercials. You see... Uh, clothing, you see mascara, eyelashes, makeup, all kinds of things that place the emphasis on the wrong thing. You know, not saying that you can't look good and be beautiful and be as, as attractive as you desire for your spouse, your husband, that's fine. But the true, the true cultivation should take place inside. It's the inner beauty that makes the difference. Yeah, not the styling of the hair, not the appearance. It's the inner, inner beauty of a person. Because I've seen some, yeah, I've seen some very, you know, uh, attractive individuals, young ladies. But their personality, who they are, you know, when they open their mouth and reveal themselves, it was something totally, totally different. So what he is saying is not the outward appearance. And the world is saying, yes, it is. You know, you can get a, you know, a Tommy Tuck and, and a nip, and you can do fat suction and all kinds of stuff. There's billions of dollars spent on the outward man. And he's saying this, especially to the ladies. He said, look at verse 3, who's a dirty, let it not be the outward a dirty, or patting the hair, and wearing of gold, or of putting on of, of apparel. And there's quite a few hairstyles I've seen. That has been very interesting. You know, there's quite a few colors I've seen, which has also been very, very interesting. You know, but uh, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis that we need to make sure we focus on is cultivating inner beauty from the inside. Yeah, you want to be beautiful inside, inwardly, not just outwardly. All right. But let, verse 4 says, let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. A meek and quiet spirit. Cultivating that type of spirit. Working with, you know, keeping yourself uh, just humble and quiet for your husband. Walking in holiness and love. That's what God is after. And in the sight of God, this is a great price. Isn't that awesome? So when you do that, you live that kind of way, you walk before your spouse, that is a great price to the Lord. It's very precious. All right, verse 5. For after this matter in the old time, the holy woman also who trusted in God Adorn themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Notice that's lowercase, not the capital. Calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well 
and are not afraid with any amazement. So we are indeed cultivating a lifestyle of beauty, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. It's a beauty that reflects gentleness, graciousness, you know, kindness. Yes, and he said Sarah had this thing. It's, it's a beauty that reflects loyalty. Yes, to your husband and spouse. And that, that's something very powerful. You need to be loyal. Yes, you have to be loyal. So th this, is what, this is what it's saying. You would, be, you, you would be true daughters of Sarah if you, if you address your husband with respect. And the Bible tells us that more than love, a, a husband or a man needs to be reverence. Reverence, yeah. Elevated to the point where he is important. And, and he, so wife, that's your job. To make that man feel like he is special, he is important. So that is a very powerful, powerful example that he's using, even with Sarah. Look at verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. So one of the things that we've been given men is an assignment. An assignment to gain and gather data. We need information. Don't you feel that way sometimes? Yes. Sometimes a wife could be different or a different mood or goes through uh, different changes and so forth. You need to study. Yeah. You need to dwell with them according to what? Knowledge. Yes. But she is an assignment where you need to gather all the information that you can to make sure that mama's happy. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, what? Verse 7, likewise ye husband, dwell with them. And that's something. Dwell with them. You got to, you got to be there. You know, you, you, you can't, can't leave now. You got to dwell with them. But you use knowledge. You use wisdom. What things bother her? What things upset her? You know, what, what, what things I do, you know, that, that, that causes friction or even, even strife in the relationship. Those are things that you have to consider. All right? And so why is this so important, dwelling with them according to knowledge? Because when you become one as a couple, as a married couple, even it affects your prayers. God sees you as one. And look what it says. Likewise, ye husband, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, all right, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Isn't that something? So one of the reasons we dwell together, one of the reasons we get knowledge, and we want to make sure that we keep the marriage free from strife. You don't want any strife to enter into the marriage. You don't want any schism. You know, have 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 one not talking or speaking to the other. That's a uh, that's just a, a de deceitful treat, a trick of the enemy. Yes, to have you not talking because you want your prayers answered. I know I want my prayers answered. I don't want my prayers bouncing off the wall, bouncing off the ceiling. But it said, hey, you you dwell together. You get knowledge. You learn. You, 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 you assess each other. You know what upsets them. You know what causes problems. And the reason you want to do this, this is so important and so precious, is because you don't want your prayers. Prayers is when we intercede and when we present our cases before God to be hindered. I don't, we don't want nothing hindering our prayers, and we most certainly don't want it to be close enough in the family. Yeah, that's him. It's hard enough with Satan, you know, trying to stop your prayers from being delivered. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament. But you sure doesn't. You sure don't want your, you know, relationship between you and your spouse to be, you know, schism and 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 and, and friction and discord. You don't want that at all, because that that too can surely cause some of your prayers to not be heard. Yes, isn't that something? All right, verse 8. Finally, 
Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brothers. Be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto call that ye should inherit the blessing. Verse 9 again, not rendering evil for evil. So we don't, we're not trying to retaliate. We're not trying to, you know, uh, get someone back. We're not going evil for evil or tit for tat. Yeah, there's no retaliation involved here. All right? And this is powerful, that you may, you should inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days. Now you tell me, who wouldn't take this offer? He's f Peter is fixing to give us a secret to how to love and enjoy life, okay, and see good days. Love and enjoy your life and see good days. What's the secret, Peter? What's the word about enjoying my life and seeing good days? But the first thing you got to realize is you got to, you got refrain, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Now, isn't that something? Tongue is something else. It is absolutely something else that we have to be aware of that can cause us not, not to have good days. It causes us not to be able to actually love life. It's just below our nose, which is a problem. James chapter 3, verse 2, you can read it later, you don't have to turn to it. It says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and is able to bridle the whole body. If you cannot offend in word, you are a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. And he goes on further to tell about the tongue no man can tame. You know, you know the story of James if you've not read that those scriptures that, that he shares about the tongue. If you go to Old Testament Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 gives us a description on this tongue. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Isn't that powerful? That thing just a couple of inches below your nose has the power of death and life. Death and life. So think about that. He's saying, if you want to love life and see good days, the first thing you got to deal with is that, that tongue just below your nose. Keep it from refraining from all evil and make sure your lips speak that speak no guile. So there's the secret. Good days. Peter, how can I love my life? How can I enjoy life? Control that tongue. Refrain from evil. And how can I have good days? Let your lips speak no guile. So it goes right back. Right back. And you've got to keep this in mind. Words are powerful. Yes, words are very powerful. And words do hurt. That old thing, this thing, sticks and stones may break my bones, but, you know, Words don't hurt. That is not true. Words do hurt. They're, they actually do hurt. You know, when I think about this, you know, I think about this pastor, this, this joke here, this pastor who was thinking about getting dentures, and uh, sure enough, he, he went to the dentist and everything and came back to the church. First Sunday, he preached, and uh, he only... Only, only preached for about 20 minutes. He came back the next Sunday, he preached. And he preached a little longer, he preached about 30 minutes. Came back that third Sunday, he preached. And the pastor preached for two hours. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. And one of the deacons had enough nerve to ask him. He says, listen, he said, the, the first Sunday you came, you, you, you only preached 20 minutes. The second Sunday, you, you preach a little bit over 30 minutes. But but today, you preach for two hours. You say, what happened? Well, the pastor said, well, the, the, first, the first 
Sunday I preach. Uh, I had just got fitted for for uh, my dentures. The next Sunday I preach, uh, my gum was still a little sore. But this Sunday I preach, I found out that the problem was is that I picked up my wife's dentures and put them in by accident. I hope you got that. <laughs> Amen. That gave Pastor a chuckle. All right. Back to the story. So he that will love life and see good days, let him reframe his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Verse 11. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Hallelujah. Living right, right living has benefits. And his ears are open to their prayers. For the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. All right. So keep, keep, keep in mind. Keep that in mind. Amen. All right, verse 13. And who is he that will harm you? Come on. He that, who is he that will harm thee if he be followers of that which is good? Think about that. Yes. If, if with your heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? That, that, that's, I like that little interpretation there. In your heart and soul, when you're doing good, who is that that can harm you if you be followers of that which is good? You, do you actually think you can be stopped? And the answer to that question is no. So when your heart and soul are doing good, you cannot be stopped. Who will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Hallelujah. But if you suffer now, look at verse 14. But if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. All right, that's the key, for righteousness' sake. All right, so you make sure if you are suffering, it's not because of something that you've caused to be the issue or the problem. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and I like this, and be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now some may say, Pastor, it's kind of difficult now in the times we're living in, you know, to, 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 to actually just, just, stand ready to, to share and give an answer on, because of the reason of our hope. You know, for some people, it seems to be waning because they, they like it's, things are just not moving fast enough or things are not, no, no, no. You got to keep what we say hope alive. You got to always remember that, that you know, that's what the world is looking for. They need hope desperately. That's why they need to see your light. Your light has to shine. Because God will give you an opportunity, who knows, to speak life into a person or to speak wisdom into an individual that can change and alter their lives. And so people are desperately, they're desperately needing direction and wisdom and guidance. So it says, always be ready. Always be ready to give an answer. What's your smile? Why are you smile all the time? Why are you happy all the time? Why 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 it seems like you come to work just bouncing and and on top of the world? Be ready to give an answer. Tell them it's Jesus. Uh, Jesus is Lord, He's my Savior, that's why. It's because of casting all my cares upon my Lord and my Savior. Jesus takes care of me. So have it a hope. Be ready to give an answer. Ain't that powerful? Always be ready to have an answer. So, and that, that implies now that you are being watched and you are being observed. All right. Let's look at verse 16. 
having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you or falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing. All right, that is the key word now. If the will of God means that you're going to go through something for doing well, that's okay. Than for evil doing. But we want to be sure it's not because of something you done that's wrong or that's evil. Verse 18. For Christ also have once offered for sins the just for the unjust, and that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Being put to death in the flesh. For our Lord and Savior was quickened by the Spirit. And when you think of the, 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 the message, Bible interpretation of those verses, it says, In with heart and soul you're doing good. And do you think you can be stopped? No way. Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ your Master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living that the way you are. And always with the utmost courtesy, keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. Isn't that powerful? When people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. But they end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. It's better to suffer for doing good it's better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants than to be punished for doing bad. That's what Christ did definitely for us. Suffer because of our sins. The righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through, through it all, was put to death, and made alive to bring God, to bring us to God. Suffered all our sins, was put to death and made alive in order to bring us to God. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome interpretation. Amen. All right, as we get ready to look at our closing verses here, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, looking at verse 19 through 22. Verse 19 through 22. All right. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Jesus went and preached to the spirits of prison. Now there's a lot of different interpretations for this particular verse. Uh, but the one that's favorable for me. Now some people think that it's, it's. You remember in Genesis. Before giants was born in the land. It says that the sons of God. Saw the daughters upon the earth. That they were you know fair beautiful. And it's kind of, it sounds like the way the verse teaches is that these were angels who had had intimate relationships with earthly women. But that's not the case because when you understand this, you realize Jesus made it very clear about the, our status when we go to heaven. He said, when we are in heaven, we neither marry or giving in marriage. We'll be like the angels. Remember that? We'll be just like the angels. So the angels, they don't marry, they don't give in marriage. Angels don't, don't have sexual relations. And that's what he's, he's sharing here. So well then, who are those spirits? I believe, and another, another translation and, and interpretation of it, I believe that it was during Jesus' death, after his crucifixion, that he went into the very pit of the earth, opportunity for, the, for those who preceded Christ to accept Christ. Uh, let me say that again. An opportun uh, opportunity for those who preceded Christ to accept Christ. Making sure all bases covered. Right, because someone may ask the question, what, what did the people do who, you know, who, who came and lived before Christ? Do they have an opportunity? I believe this is exactly what this verse is saying. He went also and preached unto the spirits in prisons. 
So no one has a legit excuse to saying that they were left out. Isn't God good? Now, like I said, there are many interpretations for that one verse of, 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 of verse 19. But I believe that's, that's the best one. And uh, that's the one that pastor is sticking with. All right, now look at verse 20. We sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was pre preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Isn't that something? 120 years. Look at God's patience. Look at God's long suffering. 120 years of God's patience was just simply ignored. And and when when the, God shut Noah and his family up in the ark, everyone else drowned, but Noah with the animals survived. That's awesome. And you, it's something to think about. But look at the long suffering he talks about. See, a lot of times we look at the world, the way things are going, and, and the Bible teaches us that God is not slight concerning his promises. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And that's why God, we, we're, we're ready. We're saying, Lord, there's nothing else left to happen for Christ to break the sky and rapture up his people out of this, this old evil world. But no, the Bible says God is not slight concerning his promises. So Jesus has not returned yet because God is giving as much time as he wants for those who will accept Christ to do so. So he's long-suffering. This is what this verse says. For when once long-suffering, he waited in the days of Noah, 120 years, it's going to rain, and the only ones he saved was a few folk, and that was his family. Isn't that something? Yeah. But then look at the times we're living in now. Look at what people are doing. Look at church attendance. Look at... Um, uh, just just individuals who, who have given up on the Lord and, and who are out worshiping uh, different things. That I hear a lot of the, some of the famous people talk about the universe. And why would you worship the universe when God created the universe? But anyway, only a few were saved, eight souls to be exact. Verse 21 through 22. The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And verse 22 says, Who is gone into heaven? All right. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and power being made subject unto him. Angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto Jesus. We have a special gift and an awesome weapon. We can call on the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. There's deliverance in that name. There's healing in that name. We can call on the name of Jesus. Jesus. And I'd like to just close this out with the amp, with not the amplified, but the message interpretation of verses 19 through 22. Say, so he went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days of Noah that he built the ship, only a few were saved then. Eight to be exact. Saved from the waters by water. The waters of baptism do that for you. Not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus. Resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything. Jesus, hallelujah, has the last word on everything. Say that again. Jesus has the last word. On everything. Jesus. Not the devil. Not your circumstances. Not your situation. Not your body. Not your doctors. Not, not the banker. No, no. Jesus had the last, has the last word on everything. 
And I, I, I love that. It, we, it, we have seen God's power. And I tell you, but he says Jesus has the last word. When I, I, I think about um, the, the trees that we wanted to cut down that, that you know, it, it wasn't allowed because we didn't have a permit. And we were denied before we could start building the church uh, uh, access to save funds. And one of our members who's going on now, Brother Herbert, was willing to help us and do that. And, 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 and they said no. Oh, but a couple of weeks later, God said yes. The tree fell over on its own just a little rain and wind and that tree fell over and we were able to cut down the remaining of the trees because hey Jesus has the last word on everything say it again Jesus has the last word on everything on everything and he's standing right along God and what he says goes you need to kind of imprint that in your heart this week I know some of you, let's say, the, the times are challenging and you don't know personally what you're going through. But keep that in mind, that Jesus has the last word on everything. And what he says goes. Amen? So not the doctor, not the banker, not your circumstances, not your situation. You continue to keep praying and trust the Lord. And say this with pastors as we get ready to close, because Jesus, say it with me. Say, Jesus has the last word on everything. Amen and amen. God bless you, family. We love you. We thank God for you. It's always my pleasure and honor being with you, spending this time together. Continue to pray for one for another. Continue to lift up, up and we lift you up. And you guys are so special, and I appreciate you so much. We love you and thank you for taking this opportunity to share with pastor as we, as we sign off now. So God bless and keep you as our prayer. We love you.